On June 18th, 2007, someone posted on the StarWars.com message boards that they had noticed a new hardcover Star Wars book that was scheduled to be released towards the end of the year. And they were like, what's that? Sue Rostoni from Lucas Licensing chimed in to say that late last week, so presumably between June 13th and June 16th, 2007, Shelley Shapiro from Delray Books called up Sue and said, hey, we'd like to put another Star Wars book on the publishing schedule. And they called up Drew Karpishin, asked if he'd be interested in writing a Bane novel, and he agreed. So Bane number two was scheduled to be released December 26th, 2007. Six months from conception to publication is a ridiculously shortened period of time. Darth Bane, Rule of Two, ultimately made it to number 12 on the New York Times bestseller list for the week of January 20th, 2008 and was ultimately on the list for two weeks. So as with the first Darth Bane novel, Path of Destruction, I've heard a lot about these books over the years, but I was interested, especially after my pretty good experience with Path of Destruction, to tackle this one and see what the middle book had to offer. So first, a brief summary. After the Sith Brotherhood of Darkness was wiped out thanks to the Thought Bomb during the Seventh Battle of Rusin, the last surviving Sith, Darth Bane, has instituted a harsh new policy, the Rule of Two. One master to embody the power, one apprentice to crave it. Bane has taken the young girl, Zana, formerly known as Rain, as his apprentice. And together the two start Bane's quest to eliminate the Jedi and dominate the galaxy. But not all the Jedi believe that the Sith were wiped out at Rusan, in particular the Padawan of one of the great masters who was killed there. So while Path of Destruction was broken up into three parts, Rule of Two contains two. Part one is set immediately after the Seventh Battle of Rusan, immediately dealing with the consequences of the Thought Bomb, and follow our four main characters, Darth Bane, Zana, her cousin Darovit, and the Jedi Padawan Johan Othone through the immediate aftermath of those events. That's the prologue through chapter nine or pages zero through 126. From chapter 11 onward, we pick up 10 years later. So we skip a fair bit of Zahn of Straining and instead see various disconnected threads, what Bane is doing to keep the Jedi's eye away from his activities as well as his inquiries into the Orbalisk parasites that he got after visiting Freedon Nad's tomb. And this all coalesces into this big Jedi versus Sith showdown on the world of Tython and then sort of the aftermath of that battle as well. And part two goes from page 127 to page 320. So I guess you could say that part one everything after the thought bomb is like the first third or more of the book and then the latter two-thirds slash half is that ten years later stuff. So let's start with Zana because if Path of Destruction was really Darth Bane's build on Roman, Rule of Two is more about Zana in a way than it is about Bane himself. When Bane picks up Zana on Rusan, she's lost the bouncer alien who saved her life and she thinks her family is all gone. Zana is strong in the Force, and she also has this latent anger in her about her situation, which Bane is able to prod and teach her to use the dark side, to use her anger to fuel her abilities. However, Zana is not alone. One of her cousins was killed during the events on Rusan, but her other cousin Darovit, who formerly went by the nickname of Tomcat, is still alive. He has some force potential, and but not a lot, so he, the thought bomb doesn't kill him like it does everyone else 
in its vicinity, and he's not sure what to do because he originally sided with the Jedi, then he went over to the Sith side, but he doesn't feel very good about siding with them either, and when he runs into Bane and Zana, he tries to attack Bane because he recognizes Bane as a Sith Lord, and Zana destroys his hand. And while this is an act of violence, it's also an act of mercy, because Bane would have killed Derovit, and Zana, in wounding him in that way, spared his life. Zana is then given an ultimatum by Bane. He's going to the Beast Moon of Onderon, because in the Sis camp, he found a book that was the property of Cordis that had the location of Freedon Nad's tomb. And he says, I'm going, I'm leaving you here, you better make your way to Onderon in a week, or I'm leaving you behind and you're not the apprentice. So then Zana finds people who take pity on her, part of the Jedi's army of light, and she kills them all commandeers the ship and makes her way to Onderon. When the novel picks up ten years later, Zana is like the public side of Bane's plan to gain power without the Jedi and the Republic noticing. Because of his Orbalisk armor, which I'll get into, he's rather noticeable. But Zana is not. She's apparently a very attractive young woman, but she can be inconspicuous in a way that her master cannot. So we get sort of like series of little quests that she's doing. She is on Sereno, she is stoking up Separatist descent, goads them into trying to assassinate the now retired Supreme Chancellor Valorum, and then seeks out this group's leader, gets a lot of information from him, brings him to her master, that man tries to kill Bane and fails. And Zana tells Bane that from that man, Hetan, she learned the location of a Sith holocron, which Bane is looking for because he wants to learn how to create his own Sith holocron. So while Bane heads off to the deep core world of Tython, which was like maybe the origination of the Jedi Order, but then became like a place of darkness, Zana is dispatched to Coruscant to try to find more information about the Orbalisk parasites that plague him. And it's while she's there that she runs into Derovit, that she finds the information she was looking for about the Orbalisks, and they head off to Tython, and then they are pursued by Johum and other Jedi like Farfalla. And there's a big showdown between them, and the Sith are victorious. Bane is a great fighter, and while Zana is not a great fighter, she knows Sith sorcery, which is one thing that I think is an interesting concept. I always like the idea of the Witches of Dathomir and the Night Sisters and this sense of casting spells rather than Jedi way that we see in the movies. So I was very interested by the idea of Sith sorcery, even if the reality is that we don't really see a lot of it. It seems that Zana can make herself invisible, imperceptible, and she can also drive people mad, but that's really the gist of it. With that time jump, we don't really see any of Zana's training. We just go right from child Zana to pretty proficient Sith apprentice Zana. But unfortunately, during that battle, Bane was hit with a bunch of electricity, a number of the Orbalists were killed, and now he is dying. So she rushes back to the world of Ambria, which is where their headquarters was, but specifically where the Force healer Caleb lives. This is the guy that Bane threatened into healing him in book number one. And Zana can't really threaten Caleb into healing Bane. She has to send off a message to Coruscant that there's a Sith here, but she still gets her way in the end. A lot of Zana's story is more along the lines of, oh, is she really gonna be a true Sith? Is she really gonna murder people and turn on her own family like this? And you know what, I rather appreciate the fact that the answer is yes, that Zana is allowed to just be straight up evil. That we see her showing mercy to Derovit in the beginning, but by the time you get to the end, Zana's killing Jedi. She doesn't kill Derovit with her own hands, but she drives him mad and then sets up a situation in such a way that he's going to be accused of being the Sith on 
Ambria and killed by the Jedi who arrive there. In the end, Zana shows that she is not merciful, and she has a fair bit of cunning and scheming to her, not just in the way that she set up the situation so that the Jedi will think, oh, there was a Sith running around, like Johan said, but we killed him and we're all good now, but also the way in that she puts doubts in Bane's mind about whether the Orbalisk armor is a good idea to begin with, and he ends the novel having removed it all, which if she's going to make a play against him in the third book, is definitely a point in her favor. Bane's story is almost wholly holocron and orbalisk motivated. He heads off to the beast moon of Onderon because he wants to find knowledge, and he does find freed on Nad's holocron and get a lot of information from it. But while there, he's bitten by a couple of the orbalisk parasites and learns that there are good things and bad things from that. The good things is that they're basically like living armor. They can boost his ability to touch the dark side, but you can't remove them without dying, and they do weaken you because they're basically just eating from you all the time. So it's like, okay, you've got really good armor, but at what cost? we pick up in part two, Bane is obsessed with making his own holocron. Apparently he has tried several times and failed. We see one failed attempt within the story itself. And so there's a lot of Bane just like lashing out in anger around him, almost losing his ability to make sense of and perceive what's going on around him when he gets in these blood rages, which are, definitely seem to be fueled by the Orbalisks. So when Zana tells him of the possible existence of another holocron that would hopefully tell him how to create holocrons, he runs off after it. And he does receive that information. He gets that holocron from an ancient Sith who was a shapeshifter, like the shapeshifter in the Galaxy of Fear books. Cool. And going to Tython ends up working out as well because, sure, he almost dies, but his orbalists are removed. He doesn't have that well, it works, but at what cost going forward? He's a very cold master, though. He's taught Zana what she needs to know, but there's no warm feelings there between master and apprentice. It's not a friendly relationship like some of the Jedi have with their Padawans. It's definitely a she will learn what she needs to survive, and if not, she'll die in the process. And he maybe will care in the fact that he'll then have to find another apprentice, but not that much. Our third main character is Zana's cousin, Darovit. That Darovit was interesting, especially in the second part, where he becomes a hermit on Rusan. And when the Jedi start to build a monument to honor all the Jedi who died at the Seventh Battle of Rusan, he's sabotaging it. He doesn't want this to be remembered. The Sith destroyed Rusan, but the Jedi did as well in their constant battles back and forth, and I thought that was interesting. I like the concept of him becoming a hermit, him trying to heal despite his very limited force ability and his unwillingness to side with Jedi or Sith, still trying to find a way forward to help. But of course, Johan convinces him to come back to Coruscant to tell the council about how he saw there was remaining Sith because Derivit did encounter Darth Bane and his cousin. And unfortunately, that puts Derivit on Coruscant when Zahn is on Coruscant, so she takes him with her. They are, of course, tracked to Tython. Then she takes him with her to Ambria you know, thinking he's a healer, maybe he can help heal Bane. And in the end, I just feel sad for Derivit because Derivit believed in his cousin, believed that Zana would be kind to him, would be merciful to him, wouldn't be an evil Sith in the end, but she was, and it was a sad end for him. I wish I felt sad about Johan's death like I did about Derivit's, but I don't because the Jedi come off as pretty dumb in Rule of Two. Johan questions Sith mercenaries and they say, there was a Dark Lord 
after the bomb went off and he tried to kill us and he brings it to Farfalla's attention and it's like, no, no, there's no Sith left. Ah, we're not gonna pursue this. Oh, when Derivit tells him about the Sith, he's like, we have to bring you to the Jedi Council to tell them about this. And then of course, when Derivit leaves with Zana, Johan tells Farfalla and they're like, oh, well, we'll get a team and we'll chase off after them because the Jedi Council wouldn't approve. And just five of them chase off after Zana and Bane and Derivit, but Derivit doesn't even count. And at least they brought a weapons master and then like another very highly trained warrior. And the Athorian is good in battle meditation, even if that seems like a weak point, if the Jedi using battle meditation has to be in the same room as them. That's just strategically dumb. I just feel like the Jedi are very willing to let things fly here. No one's willing to dig in to investigate like, are the Sith really gone or not? They're like, yeah, of course they're gone. Whoo, let's move forward. Let's reform the Republic. Let's disband the Army of Light. And we're just going to be mediators for the Republic now. And it's like, guys, you really weren't going to dig into this any further? Part of this reluctance to look further may be because all of this prompting is coming from a young Jedi, a Padawan, and then a young Jedi Knight, who in Johan's case is not a particularly good warrior. So I wondered how this plot thread would have changed if, say, Farfalla was the one who was pushing for all of this, but in the end they just all come off as easily outmaneuvered here. So I found Rule of Two to be a pretty fast-paced read. I didn't feel particularly bogged down in any of the sections as I did with book number one, but I did have some definite issues with it. The first issue was just didn't feel like there was a lot here in Rule of Two. It seemed like a lot of disconnected storylines that all meet up when the Jedi attack the Sith on Tython. Part one seemed to be tying up other stuff from the Battle of Rusan, and specifically the things that occurred in Kevin J. Anderson's Bane of the Sith short story and in the Jedi vs. Sith comic as well. And that's like over a third of the book. Continuity stuff. We can't just end it where Path of Destruction ended. We've got to do all this other stuff to tie into the existing stories. Even if again, as I found with Path of Destruction, this wasn't exactly telling those stories, but telling a third version. And then when we pick up in part two, it's like the Separatist scheme, Bane trying to make a holocron, Bane looking for a holocron, Zana looking for Orbalisk information, then they all head to Tython, and then the stuff on Ambria is the fallout from that battle. I guess you could say that the overarching theme of Rule of Two is Zana's development as a Sith, Zana progressing to the point where she has no mercy, where she's willing to sacrifice her cousin to make sure that they stay hidden. Which works for a theme, it just felt like less like an overarching plot and more like episodes and we'd see the end of this episode and then the end of this episode and the end of this episode culminating in the fight on Tython and then Bane being cured on Ambria. But it just didn't feel like as cohesive a story as book number one was. I don't know whether I should attribute that to the rush timeline or not. Issue number three was again probably trying to carry over continuity from Bane of the Sith but I don't understand how Darth Bane can mount a beast and fly it from the moon to Onduran, even using the dark side at one point to make like a bubble around them. I don't care how close they are to each other, there is a point where like the atmosphere of one ends and the atmosphere of the other ends and you're just in space, you're in zero gravity, and I don't know I just don't get how you can do that. But again, in the short story, his ship is wrecked. He has no other way to get from the moon to the planet. So he has to mount a beast. It just, I don't get how. But I guess my third issue with Rule of Two was noticing how this is like a thousand years before the Battle of Yavin, but nothing's really different 
from the prequel trilogy or even from the original trilogy. What is it about Star Wars that their technology has stagnated to the point that in a thousand years there is like no difference? And not even that, but like political stuff. We have these reformations of the Republic, but on Sereno there's separatists and sure, you know, they're all gonna be wiped out because of Zana's goaded assassination attempt, but it just felt a little too close to what we see in the prequels that like, oh, of course there's separatists on Sereno, but like this is a thousand years before the Republic falls. You're telling me that was already an issue then? You're telling me that ships are exactly the same, that everything is exactly the same as it will be centuries and centuries from now? So in short, the second book in the Darth Bane trilogy, Rule of Two, is a fast-paced read. And more than anything, it's about Zana's growth as a Sith and her willingness by the end to give up on her family and make the strategic choice, even if it is a grim one. I feel like middle books and trilogies often have a rough time because you're bridging the gap between book one and three. You can't conclude things until book three. So what are you really gonna do in book number two? And I think where Rule of Two suffers is that it feels like a lot of disparate subplots and a lot of continuity nods, which are needed, but come very heavily, especially in the first part. To the point that there's definitely a theme to this book, but the plot is a little all over the place in the end. I do wish we could have seen a little bit more of Zana's training, of Zana's abilities here, but I found Zana interesting and I appreciate the fact that she was allowed to be a female villain who's just straight up evil in the end. A lot of times female villains turn back to the light side and are redeemed. Zana is not. Zana is an evil woman and I'm fine with that. So next time I'm going to be reading the first book in the Coruscant Knights trilogy by Michael Reeves, Jedi Twilight.